So I think we'll go ahead and start with some of the housekeeping because that will take us a few minutes and we'll let a few more people join us. This is Terry Brister. I'm the National Director for Research and Quality Assurance at NAMI, and we are so excited to have all of you on the call this afternoon. We have almost 1,200 people registered to be with us this afternoon, and we are just ecstatic about that, and so happy to have all of you here. We want to remind you that we have everyone muted. The only people that will be that we'll be hearing from today are our presenter and from uh, our CEO, Dan Gillison, our medical director, Ken Duckworth, and we also have NAMI's Director of Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity on the call, and she's available for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. But again, the rest of you are muted, and that's so that you're able to hear the presenter and able to interact, uh, to hear the responses to the questions and answers at the end. We want to remind you that you do have the chat feature. Again, the slide that you see in front of you is showing you where that is and has some instructions on how it works. And then uh, you also see at the bottom for Q&A, you can submit questions as well. And if you look on the bottom of your screen, you'll see the little icons, the one that looks like a little uh, caption. If you click on that, that opens up the chat feature for you. If you click on the circle with the three dots in it, it gives you the option of clicking on Q&A, and that will enable you to submit your questions during Sam's presentation. And then as with our other Ask the Expert calls, Dr. Ken Duckworth will be moderating. So he'll be taking your questions and sharing them with Sam. Frequently we get questions that are similar, so he, he puts those together and combines them so that you get the best experience as participants. Um, we want to remind you that when you're submitting your questions, if you'll choose all panelists as the option. You have an option of submitting things privately, but if you'll choose all panelists, that will make it go through. Um, the call is being recorded. We post recordings of these calls on NAMI.org backslash ask the expert. Something that we started doing just since the pandemic is getting a, a written transcription of each of these recordings. That way, if you're unable to hear clearly, have any kind of difficulties with that, you can download a copy of the written transcription as well. Following the webinar today, we'll be emailing to everybody who registered, not just the people who participated, but anyone who registered will get a link to the recording. You'll get a PDF of the slide deck and any other files that are available for download. And I don't believe we have any additional files on this particular presentation. But with that, Sam, I'd like to ask you to advance the slide, if you would, Ken, and then uh, we will turn it over to Dan Gillison, NAMI CEO, so he can provide the welcome. Elise, you may need to give Sam presenter access. Perfect. Oh, Sam, you have to share your screen, is what Elise is telling me. There we go. Love technology. Thank you, Sam. And Dan, we can't hear you, so if you can unmute. All right, there we go. Thank you, Terry, and um, uh, good to be with everyone on this afternoon. And uh, uh, welcome to the Ask the Expert webinar. Uh, this is a very important series that we do, and it's for you, our audience, and, and, and uh, we're very excited to be with you on this afternoon. The Trevor Project was founded in 1988 is the leading national organization providing crisis intervention and suicide prevention services to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning young people under 25. Uh, this organization has been doing an incredible amount of work, uh, and I got to know them uh, years ago and uh, have actually seen their work in process for many in the community. And we want to thank them for being with us on today and thank them for their work. So with that said, I'd like to hand it off to our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Ken Duckworth. Ken? Uh, thanks, everybody, and uh, thanks, Dan, and welcome, everybody. Uh, June's Pride Month, and so we're delighted uh, to be focusing on uh, the issues of LGBTQ uh, youth. Uh, Sam Brinton is today's speaker and is one of the world's leading advocates for this population. They are the founder of the 50 Bill 50 States campaign at the Trevor Project to end the dangerous and discredited practice of conversion therapy, first in the United States and then around the globe. 
As a survivor of conversion therapy, Sam has spoken before the United Nations and the United States Congress and has testified on legislation from coast to coast. Sam uses they, them, or theirs as pronouns as a gender fluid person. I wanna emphasize Sam is an expert, but is not a clinician. So if there are clinically related questions, I may jump in and Sam and I have agreed upon that. Uh, he is trained as a nuclear engineer, which means he's a lot smarter than I am, but I, he's not gonna be able to take clinical questions per se. Sam, I wanna thank you uh, for coming uh, on today's conversation for all the work you're doing and for your leadership. Please take it away, Sam. You might Unmute. be muted, Sam. Unmute. There we go. Welcome there to we technology. Go. Thanks so much. Can everyone hear me? Ken? Yes, you sound great. Great. Perfect. Thanks so much. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you again for this wonderful uh, invitation. I am so excited to be here with all of you today. Um, it's a big topic. There's a lot of slides. I do not want to have, you know, uh, parallelization via PowerPoint. So I'm going to do my best to make this as accessible as possible. I promise it starts with some sad stats, but ends with some big wins. So if you stick with me, um, we're gonna have a really good Pride Month. Okay, first off, who is this person? And there we go. First off, who is this person talking to you? And there we go. Uh, you already heard my bio. I use they and them as my pronouns. Um, I serve as the VP of Advocacy and Government Affairs, which basically means um, instead of the actual lifeline itself, which I'll get into, my job is the um, you know, political, the advocate, the person, whether it be Congress or the President or the Supreme Court, um, which we had some good moments in that this week, um, right? There's this um, sense of activity. How do we do something um, to better the lives of LGBTQ youth? And that's kind of my job. It's the dream. I'm excited to be here. Little known facts about me. You did learn that I was a nuclear engineer. Other little known facts about me, just that we hopefully you'll stay interested, is um, I'm an opera singer. So I sing with the Washington National Opera, have a degree in vocal music performance, and I'm a huge fan of singing. So Maybe if you're really nice, I'll sing uh, at the end. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> okay, so who is um, the Trevor Project? The Trevor Project is, as we mentioned, the world's largest suicide prevention organization for LGBTQ young people. I couldn't have said it better. Dan already um, let you know. We've been around for 20 years, um, and we have a variety of different services. I'm going to start with those services knowing that this is not an advertisement, but that way you'll have these resources available to help those in your life who may find them useful or yourself. And we're super glad that we get to give that resource. First off, a lifeline, 866-488-7386. Uh, really important call centers um, where we are now completely remote with our call centers, but across the country, 24-7, 365, we're answering the phone and it never stops ringing. It hasn't for 20 years. We are, um, Again, specific, free, confidential, it's, it's there for LGBTQ youth as they call us. And I'll be clear about that because I know we get sometimes get questions about this. We tailor our services to those under age 25, but we serve everyone. If you call, you're not going to get told no, we're not going to answer your call um, because we recognize that people are in crisis. We just tailor our services to LGBTQ youth who are under age 25, just as a little known fact. Now, however, let's say you're a good millennial like me and you can't stand to talk on the phone. Well, uh, we have text and chat. So start to 678, 678, um, or the backslash help gives you digital services. This ability to interact with us in ways that aren't necessarily um, auditory. Really important for a couple of different reasons that you might not think of, but really are important to our community. First off is um, confidentiality. Although obviously most individuals do not want to disclose uh, suicidal ideation to those around them, if you're talking about something also as private as sexual orientation and gender identity, which a person may not be out to their family, the idea of talking about that auditorily on the phone could be really difficult for someone. Another reason that you might think of um, is for people like myself, who um, our gender identity is not in alignment with um, you know, what we were assigned at birth, 
we don't always adore how our voices sound, right? Especially if we're really emotional and we're crying, we may, may not be able to control our voices in ways that will give um, folks the ability to, you know, support us in the pronouns or representation that we're trying to express. So texting and chatting can be a way to get past all of that. There are no, there is no gender to an electron on a screen, right? Um, and it's much easier for us to be able to be supportive um, in ways that the person feels engaged all the way through. If you're not in crisis, however, there's really important uh, other services. And again, I promise this isn't just an advertisement for Trevor. I just want to start with um, the resources and we'll get into some of the um, reasons why these resources exist. Let's say you're not in crisis, however. Um, social media is an amazing opportunity for a lot of individuals to interact with each other, but it's not always safe. And so we created Trevor Space. I like to make the joke, think of it as like MySpace or Facebook, but we don't sell your data to the Russians. What a concept. Um, <laughs> it is literally just hundreds of thousands of LGBTQ individuals and youth. Excuse me, hundreds of thousands of LGBTQ youth from all over the globe. It's our only international service. Um, and this is questions on what's it like to take, take um, a same-sex partner to prom? What's it like to have um, a conversation with your parents about testosterone? Um, what is it like to go to an affirming church? These are all services and resources um, that not, aren't necessarily crisis moments yet, but peer-to-peer -peer conversations could make them go easier. So Trevor Space is that space that I hope you'll share with a lot of the people in your life where people can interact um, in a non-crisis conversation. If they're in crisis, we, uh, we push them for our crisis services, which I've already mentioned. Okay, so those are some of the direct services, but we also have focus areas. We are nerds. I'm a proud MIT nerd, um, and I am, uh, although I, as was mentioned by Ken, I'm no clinical expert, I think we all know the power that data can save lives, and NAMI is on the leading edge of that work. So, the research that we do is based on two major issues. One, all of the contacts that we get in. It's always anonymized. Nothing is ever released that is directly tied to a specific contact for obvious reasons. But when I see, uh, for example, a surge of calls happening on uh, a day, I can look, see what happened, and then respond to whatever is occurring in real time because I know crises are occurring. This happened, for example, in two specific situations recently. One was when Texas did a bathroom bill, AKA a don't let transgender youth use the bathroom assigned, uh, use the bathroom of their identity, but instead require them to maybe use a bathroom that it would not be safe for them to use due to the sex they were assigned at birth. It was an awful bill, awful rhetoric, and instantaneously our calls from Texas doubled. And so we were able to fly down to Texas approach in a political, educational, and, you know, just generally crisis way, hey, your words have meaning, and they're hurting LGBTQ youth, you're causing distress, here's what we can do to help, right? A really great way. We also operate the world's largest survey of LGBTQ youth. I'll get into that in a little bit with our data. We educate, just like what I'm doing right now. Trying to reach as many people as possible was one of the warning signs of suicide, and how do we have LGBT competent suicide prevention. It is not enough to just have suicide prevention. It is important for us to make sure that all of our education materials for all types of different programs are LGBTQ competent. And I'm excited to be here to be part of that program with all of you. And last but not least, obviously my fave, because uh, this is my work, um, is our advocacy. So taking this data, taking this education, and taking these crisis contact um, volume spaces and saying, let's do something about it. Let's eliminate the problem before it even gets to a level of crisis. Uh, my job is to put Trevor Project out of business. Pretty great job if I, if I do say so myself. Um, and I do that through a lot of different work uh, across the country. We'll get into some of them. But mostly, most of my major campaigns start around the work to end conversion therapy. We're going to have a whole section on conversion therapy. It's something that I hope you'll all join me in working to eradicate. So. The topic, <laughs> now that you're like, okay, we get it, man. You like Trevor Project. I know. Anyway, moving into what we're actually supposed to be talking about, which is LGBTQ young people and their mental health. I wanted to give us a framing conversation. Where are we starting with? Um, if this is actually expert, it's where are we um, starting with? First off, we know it's the second leading cause of death among young people, but 39% 
two out of five LGBTQ youth have seriously considered attempting suicide in the last 12 months. I cannot describe how horrific that is. But then it gets worse when 50%, more than 50% of transgender and non-binary youth have seriously, again, considered attempting suicide in the last 12 months. This is not ever. This is now. We are more than four to five times as likely as cisgender or straight youth um, to attempt suicide. And that's, that's not acceptable. 71% of them, however, are also reporting feeling sad or hopeless for at least two weeks in the past year. Again, not the clinical expert, but that sure sounds like a problem that we need to be addressing. And again, is higher than the um, average population. In really awful news, those who, of us, like myself, a survivor of conversion therapy, so those of us who have gone through conversion therapy are twice as likely to attempt suicide as those who did not. Now, again, let's put some numbers together. My MIT degree here, right? If half of transgender and non-binary youth have seriously considered suicide, and those are five times as likely as a straight person to attempt suicide, and then two times as like, twice as likely if they've gone through conversion therapy, that can compound to 10 times as likely as a straight and cisgender individual um, if a person has gone through conversion therapy uh, at attempting suicide. We have, a, we have a, an epidemic on our hands, and I know that word gets thrown around a lot, but it's a true problem, and that's why I'm here to try to raise that um, attention. This is a large-scale problem. Um, we serve hundreds of thousands of youth every single year. We estimate 1.8 million LGBTQ youth will be in some form of crisis this year alone. Again, I'm sure Nami has other data on this as well, but pulling from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey and our own research, we've been able to find that this is not a small problem. This is a problem in the order of millions. Right, and we um, need to recognize that these crises could be worse than um, when they when a person enters them because they may not have the same support structures. That leads us to a whole bunch of statistics. I'm not going to go through all of these. All these slides will be uh, available, but I want to highlight a couple of them because I I know there's some nerds in the room who want some of these numbers, but it gets super depressing to talk about your own community in ways of uh, you know oppression all the time. Let's just be, let's bring that into the room, right? We're, there's reasons that um, black individuals have said, I can't watch the news right now, right? Because it's awful to just continuously be watching these types of activities. It's awful to continuously be talking about the oppression of my people. So I'm just going to bring that into the room, recognizing that it is not the same issue, but it is um, a similar space and one that uh, I'm going to take my, you know, presenter prerogative and only talk um, about the last slide here. So, 76% of LGBTQ youth felt that the recent political climate impacted their mental health or sense of self. Three out of four are saying that the political climate has impacted their mental health. I am not being partisan here. That is not a number simply because of the current president. I am stating that politics matter. That's why advocacy, um, and that's why I like to collaborate with um, NAMI, is this idea of like, I think we have to collaborate because politically not advocating, that silence is literally causing major some, um, sense of self impact, right? Like that's really causing problems. So we have our work cut out for us, but together we're gonna be able to do it. So you may be asking, how has COVID specifically impacted LGBTQ youth? And I think that's a really important question because when we're talking about um, all these, you know, daily news stories, you may be noticing um, that LGBTQ people are not being mentioned, even <laughs> in five months. That's because we don't have data. People don't ask about LGBTQ youth, um, and so we don't actually know the those more than hundred thousand individuals that have died from COVID, we have literally no idea how many of them were LGBTQ because we don't ask the question. That, my friends, is a tragedy. We know already that Black individuals are, um, a quarter of the deaths related to COVID are um, Black individuals, right? That is unacceptable. And we also must recognize that at least we know that is the number. We don't even know the number of LGBTQ individuals. So I'm going to try to bring in what we are hearing and the ways that we're responding, but know that this comes with literally no data other than anecdotal from the contacts that are reaching out to us. That doesn't mean it's not powerful. I just want to be clarifying um, to those of you who may have more of these questions. 
First off, let's talk about the major issue that we all know about, social distancing, right? Social distancing, we call it physical distancing um, in the Trevor Project because it is not actually social distancing, it is physical distancing, it is the difference between physical bodies, not socially. We need to socially be connecting with individuals. And this is why many LGBTQ youth are telling us that they've lost all the social connections that they used to have. For example, extracurriculars like GSAs can't operate really easily because there's no easy way to just advertise for these things and there's no way to kind of protect the anonymity of individuals as they're going um, into these kind of spaces. Also, they just don't literally get to sit at lunch with individuals who understand their life experiences. I know for many of you that may not seem like a big deal, but in, in um, a family where you are not culturally transferring this culture, right? there is no familial, excuse me, transference of this culture. Instead, it is um, you know, conversational. And that's not happening as much anymore. We're watching that being a major challenge. Second, not only can we not go to good places, we cannot necessarily be in good places. So unsupportive or abusive places like homes now are the only place you're allowed to go. In fact, we're hearing about this all the time, however, LGBTQ youth are literally being kicked out of their homes in the midst of COVID when there's not a really safe place for them to go, not that there was, even if there wasn't COVID, but to be clear, in an unsafer um, spaces. So not only do we not get the social connection, but we're now getting negative consequences for technically being at home. This happens even worse for the individuals who may have come out in college, but now are kicked out of college and having to come back home as well. So you can understand that this is causing some severe distress. Second would be our economic strain challenges. So unemployment rampant, we all know the numbers. LGBTQ youth are, are living based on these of this employment to be able to stay away from unsupportive environments. So when that unemployment happens, everyone just talks like, well, you know, the millennials and Gen Z, they'll all just move back into their parents' basement. Well, no, not if your parents kicked you out for being who you are. I am not allowed to walk back in to my own home. That is not an option, right? I now, <laughs> I'm proud to say in the last year, I got married and bought a home. So haha, -ha, take that mom and dad. But the whole point for me has to be built on the idea of like, I'm, if I were a younger individual, I wouldn't have that option. And that would be potentially um, catastrophic. Housing instability. LGBTQ youth make up more than, um, you know, 40% of, of the homeless population. LGBTQ youth make up 40% of, of that, excuse me, homeless youth population. So we are disproportionate and have a major issue when it comes to that. You're all right now probably saying, oh my gosh, why in the world did Pam Britton come on this? This is just gonna be a depressing, depressing presentation. I'm sorry, but my, my, I'm gonna bring in the, the, the hard moments, but I promise you all of these things are able to be responded to. So I'm not gonna give you any problem that is not solvable, because that's not fair. I believe in working together through collaboration and the questions that you're gonna have, I promise you we're gonna to get to some good news here soon. So, just not yet. <laughs> um, I promise that was not a, that was not a fake. I really thought it was actually gonna move better. Okay, so increased anxiety is coming from this idea of they can't get medical attention. Um, many people are not out to a single individual in their medical um, experience because we are consistently turned away from medical experiences. You may have heard that on Friday, um, the administration put out the right to discriminate against transgender individuals in healthcare, which is just horrific. We have a lot of calls on that. There's a ton of uncertainty. If you were using college as your way away from everything and you don't know if you're gonna get to go to campus, imagine what that uncertainty feels like, right? And then there's this violent imagery on the news. If, if you are now trapped in a home, your parents are stating a lot of unsupportive things, and then all you see on the news is how the world is becoming violent um, and, um, and, and you know, fighting, that violence could be good moments, right? It could be bringing about good change, but you see it as unsafety outside too. And that is hard. There are moments of hope. Let's be very super clear. Tuesday, wow, um, it, only was, it was only on a Tuesday. Um, the Supreme Court uh, was able to clearly and emphatically state that it is against Title VII, um, against the law, to discriminate based on sexual orientation and gender identity. That is a massive moment. It is a way for us to say we deserve equality, right? Huge moment, huge, huge moment. 
that doesn't mean that we uh, are, are only seeing that news. We're seeing all the other news too, but I want to point out that we are noticing the good, the good things too. What are we doing about it? I think it's important for us to give examples of what we're doing and then feel free to ask questions other ways. We did have a Pride campaign. It is Pride Month. Shocking. <laughs> June is Pride Month. Um, <laughs> very, there's no Pride parades. I have been basically recording a lot of videos for a lot of rural Pride um, about Pride inside, right? Pride is everywhere. We transitioned away from Pride experiences and moved toward ra racial justice because we recognized that that was what was needed. We advocated for LGBTQ youth mental resources and said, you have to respond to COVID in ways that are supportive. And last but not least, we even have this protest um, safety. So we're trying to let LGBTQ know who may be going out and um, participating in this protest how to do it safely. You're an LGBTQ young person. That brings about different, different aspects of how um, you protest and how you will be treated if you're taken in by law enforcement. So it's important for us to recognize that we have to respond to where people are. Started with pride, moved to COVID, now we're in protest. Who knows what next week will be like? Legitimately, it is about the pivot. And I know you all know that, but it's hard. I'll be honest. Like being head of <laughs> being the vice president of advocacy right now, um, when every single new week brings about another thing in this work, um, is exciting. And I'm 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 gl glad for it. But goodness gracious me, um, the world could take, you know, could eat a Snickers. The world could eat a Snickers right now. I wouldn't mind it too much. Okay. However, really exciting that we are watching a national conversation around police brutality and about Black Lives Mattering. That is so powerful. Um, and it is something I cannot wait to tell my children that I was a part of, right? We have whole specific resources on black, supporting Black LGBTQ mental health. And I want to have a whole slide just where I talk about that right now, um, knowing that those questions could also come up later. And I will have a link. You're going to get the PDF, that link to the blog where all of this is been shared three million times, um, literally. I want to make sure you have it um, here as well. So first, to those black, LGBTQ black um, youth that may, you may be interacting with, these are some helpful tips and tricks. First off, recognize the common feeling. It is important that uh, we all recognize that we're feeling a lot of feelings. I'm feeling a lot of fear. I grew up in, in a lot of around the world, and I've seen these types of protests and I've seen the violence, and it sometimes brings back really harsh memories for me. But I need to remember that this is the first time that some people are feeling this, but it's not for everyone. Many people have understood what this kind of feeling of fear is, and I need to recognize that commonality. I also need to feel my emotions without judgment. I'm using me statements, but you should definitely use your own. I'm not going to tell you how to feel, so I can only do that by myself. I just realized that I sound like I'm going through puberty there, but welcome to my voice. <laughs> so recognize the common feelings. Allow yourself to feel these emotions without judgment. Notice that it's the only thing underlined. It's really important that we have to feel these emotions without judgment. I am having a hard time interacting with some of my friends because I'm feeling different emotions that they may be feeling, but I need to say, I'm feeling mine, you're feeling yours, and neither of those are wrong nor bad. We need to have them and just experience them. Then there is the centering of voices. I need to be clear. I'm excited to be here. I've heard from your leadership. Thank you so much, Shidian and Ken, right? You're going to have voices, specifically black voices and experiences that you're going to be raising that I am not that voice right now for you, but I am raising voices as I can and raising the experiences of me as a white person, what I can do to not put that pressure on black people when they do not want that pressure. I have a lot of my friends right now who are like, I'm tired of telling people what to do. Like, I need to just take care of myself. And that's something we need to give Black Voices the opportunity to do. So take that as a pragmatic best of both worlds there. Take a break from the news and social media. I am not watching nightly news right now. I can't. I can't sleep when I hear the scream. So I'm not doing it. Social media, I am super proud to say, I am limiting. I am posting the good things. We just passed an anti-conversion therapy ordinance yesterday. So I was like celebrating that. But then I take time away. Right? Good. And then last but not least, pivot to the action that you want to take. And I'm going to give you a whole bunch of them. But just know that you need to not just feel feelings, you need to do something with them. That, feeling, that action does not need to be in the streets. It can be on the couch. It can be, you know, in your mind. But that action needs to take place. So 
We've gone through LGBTQ mental health. We specifically talked about how COVID is impacting it. And then I'm going to go into something personal because it's important for us to recognize that. And then we're going to get into act hopes of actual, the actual actions that we'll take. So I'm going to talk about conversion therapy for a bit. And you may be like, Sam, that has nothing to do with today. Actually, it does. When you are trapped at home, we already have a lot more LGBTQ youth who are telling us that their parents are literally putting them into conversion therapy while they are trapped at home with them in COVID. So this is a, a really awful experience, and I'm going to explain it. It's going to start really bad and end the best part, right? So again, hinting, you're going to, you're going to love where this turns out. It, you may be asking, Sam, I've never even heard of conversion therapy. What is this? Good question. Conversion therapy is the idea that you can change someone's sexual orientation or gender identity into a straight or cisgender person. Um, it's, taken, it's taken a lot of different names over the time, so pray away the gay, conversion therapy, reparative therapy, sexual orientation change efforts for the medical, right? Like a lot of different terms. All of them, harmful, super important. Just starting off, it's not effective and it's harmful. You may be like, but my Aunt Betty went through conversion therapy and she's straight now. Aunt Betty is lying. I will never say that to Aunt Betty's face, but Aunt Betty is lying because it is not effective and potentially extremely harmful. Of the survivors that I originally knew when I came back out um, in my experiences, a large majority of them have died by suicide because we are extremely damaged by a mental health practice that is not actually healthy, it's harmful. Every major medical organization has said it is discredited. So let's be very clear. First, you might be saying, well, it worked on you know, person X. Nope, not, not true. And two, um, every major medical organization has said it doesn't work and it is potentially extremely dangerous. We know it's dangerous. So others are saying it could be potentially dangerous because they um, don't have a lot of case studies of this, which is good. Don't put kids through this to like do your silly research. Um, but we know it from our research, right? Because we're hearing from LGBTQ youth who are in conversion therapy, about to be put into conversion therapy, just got out of conversion therapy, their friends are in conversion therapy, literally every week. Every single week, we're hearing from someone in conversion therapy. I myself am a survivor of conversion therapy. I I'm going to go through my story extremely quickly. I know not enough time, but it's going to hopefully make an impact um, on how we have this conversation. So I didn't realize I was coming out when um, I told my family um, that I really liked the boy next door. And my family became very physically, my father became very physically abusive. And it was at this time that my mother stepped in and said, I've heard of this thing called conversion therapy. Let's try that instead. Like Sam is scared of you punching him, but that's not going to actually solve this problem. So we went into a conversion therapist office. I was lied to, for, and I'm, again, I'm shortening this by a lot, but I was lied to for months telling me that I was the only gay child left alive, that the government came through and killed off gay children when they were born, that I had AIDS and would die of this disease. I am a 10-year-old child. All of this is happening to me. When that wasn't enough, I would be put through what is called aversion therapy, this idea that you can physic use physical stimuli to make something painful or bad if a person thinks about something. So they would show a 10-year-old child images of uh, men holding hands, right? Me holding hands. Me, they would show me images of men holding hands um, and then uh, put my hands in ice so I would feel cold while I was seeing images of men holding hands. So I would associate that awful, um, that awful, awful um, feeling of the cold with the images I was seeing. And I'm, I'm very young, so my brain starts to associate that that's what's going to happen every single time. Same thing would happen with heat. When men holding hands were shown, I would then be, uh, have wires wrapped around my hands and heat would be applied when pictures of men to touching men were shown and turned off when pictures of men touching women were shown. It would culminate, sorry, I get emotional, I don't know um, it would culminate in electroshock therapy, where I was literally basically electrocuted while images of men having sex with men were shown. I screamed, begging my family to make it stop, but my mother and father loved me so much that they thought they were saving my life. Those are some of the stories that we hear at the Trevor Project. And before I go further, I'm sorry, I, I, I need to always do this. I need you all to take a deep breath. Let go. That was not easy to hear. I can run through it because in my brain, uh, that pain 
is my past. It is not my present. It is not my future. I work to end conversion therapy and make sure no person ever has to go through what I went through ever again. And I hope you'll join me in that. But I'm sorry for just kind of jumping into the next step. That was hard. And I'm going to clarify that it's, it's Pride Month and we're having a lot of really joyous conversations. We need to have the tough ones too. So here's the numbers. I know my nerds. <laughs> Ask the expert, right? So I'm trying to give you my, my numbers. So 700,000 individuals have gone, I know I'm smiling while I said that, that was awful, okay. 700,000 um, individuals have gone through conversion therapy, have survived conversion therapy, with 16,000 at youth, youth still at risk in the next couple of years. So let's be very clear, nearing a million, well, rounding up, right, like near, over 700,000 um, uh, have already had this, and tens of thousands are going through it every couple of years. Like this is, this is a major problem. 5% of the youth ages 13 to 25 have responded that, saying that they've been through conversion therapy or reparative therapy. That's our survey. And again, you'll have the link there to look into more of those numbers. 5% of a population being told to erase themselves on a consistent basis is unacceptable. And it is having major consequences. I am not the only one who had major suicide attempts. My, um, my fellow survivors, are reporting that 42% have ex who convert 42 of those who experience conversion therapy had a suicide attempt in the last 12 months. This is not seriously considering. This is attempts themselves. And then, so horrible. Um, when we ask trans and non-binary youth again, 57% have attempted suicide in the last 12 months. Nearing two out of three have attempted suicide in the last 12 months because of conversion therapy. We have so much work to do here, my friends. And now is the good news. We are obliterating conversion therapy on a just monumental scale. In the last few years alone, I've been able to be part of more than 20 states which have ended conversion therapy for minors by licensed mental health professionals. That is a huge when I cannot describe how in the LGBTQ community we're just so used to like decades between wins um, that for a lot of us the whiplash of employment non-discrimination and uh, marriage within the same decade is very hard but we're watching this happen on a month by month basis literally at one point before COVID every other month we were passing a law that's how fast this was happening and it will happen again but it's important to not just say that these laws are passing, these, pa these laws are also being proposed. 19 other states have proposed this type of legislation, leaving only, again, 11 states where we have work left to do, that we haven't even had a proposal. Imagine this. I hope many of you are recognizing that in a state where this is being debated, a mother has to recognize that what she's about to put her child through is being debated by her state as potentially catastrophically harmful right? Literally people losing their license over. But that's not all, but that's not all, folks, right? We're not just doing it on the state level, we're doing it on the city level. I'm proud to say that this month, we've already passed two more ordinances working to end conversion therapy. Yes, even in COVID, we are still passing local ordinances working to protect minors from conversion therapy. First, in Roland Park, Kansas, go, I'm a Kansas farm kid, so all for it. Um, yay for Kansas. Roland Park, Kansas became the first city in Kansas to end conversion therapy. And last night, literally last night, um, St. Paul, Minnesota also passed its ordinance unanimously to protect minors from conversion therapy. So resolutions, ordinances, executive orders. We've had the president of the United States, the previous president, um, President uh, Barack Obama, come out against conversion therapy, but this is not a partisan issue. Hundreds and hundreds, more than 500 Republicans have voted to end conversion therapy uh, in the states that we have done this work. Um, seven Republican governors have signed laws making sure that conversion therapy has no place in their state. So let's be very clear. This is an issue we can all get behind, and I hope you will join me in that. Okay, now we have actually the part of how you can help. And to my awesome folks uh, behind the scenes from NAMI, I hope we're doing well on time um, and doing uh, just fine. So now some uh, homework. Yes, your MIT kids giving you homework. First off, educate yourselves and others about LGBTQ mental health. I mentioned this earlier. It was hard for me to go through some of those slides because I'm worn out. I, I have to always be talking about the oppression of my people. 
but allies can educate other allies. There is the power of you saying, I don't know everything, and I'm not speaking for a community. I'm speaking, recognizing the harms that are well known, right? Tell people that LGBTQ youth are four to five times as likely to attempt suicide as a straight person, right? Tell them that nearly two out of three trans youth who go through conversion therapy have attempted suicide this year, right? Like, we need to know these things um, in order to make sure that, um, that those of us who are doing this work can reach even more people. You can be the great amplifier of the work. Second, volunteer. We have time. Whether it be through our Lifeline, digital crisis services like our text and chat, or in our advocacy team, helping myself and others out, volunteering with the Trevor Project is a really great way to directly do work on LGBTQ mental health. Obviously, I want you to volunteer with um, NAMI as well, but know that you can volunteer with organizations like us, PFLAG, who works with parents, families, and friends of organizations um, of LGBTQ people, sorry. That's really, really important. Okay, so you've educated others, right? You're volunteering with your time. Then it's important to tell your story. Op-eds. If you want to write an op-ed, yes, some of us still read the, the newspaper. I am proud to say that I'm like a pretty regular contributor right now right, to the New York Times op-ed. And I like writing in this way. I like writing my op-eds because this is an opportunity for me to share my thoughts and get these things across to a lot of people. So share an op-ed. If you're political uh, and you want to testify, go to a local school board meeting and talk to them about LGBTQ youth mental health. Have a movie night. That's why I included Boy Erased, a little known fact. Um, I got to walk the red carpet of the Oscars um, a, couple, a couple of years ago for when this movie was coming out. All about the idea of we need to share our stories. This is a story, a movie um, uh, with Nicole Kidman um, and Russell Crowe, right, about, about elk conversion therapy, but it's in an accessible way. If you're a person of faith like myself, speak with your churches. Talk about what you can do um, in the communities that you're in. And last but not least is being a safe place, excuse me, being a safe place for people in your community. Mentioning pronouns. I'll, I'll, I'll have a, a quick like learning moment, right? Like I'm going to make sure to have, like, I'm so grateful to be here. And yet like, I have to make sure that people know that my pronouns are they and them. And that doesn't always get said that way, but that's okay. I will it, use it as an educational moment and you can be the person who uses the right pronoun or even includes your pronouns in your email, um, uh, in your like title, whatever the bottom of an email is, um, the bottom of your emails, right? Like after your name, talk about your pronouns because that gives it more as an acceptable place of like, hey, just in case you wanted to know, I'm here uh, with these as my pronouns and I want to respect your pronouns too. Ask people's pronouns um, of everyone. Don't just ask it of trans folks. Like it's really annoying when people only ask me my pronouns, but no one else, right? You know why? Because I am just like everybody else. I just happen to use a different pronoun than maybe the person sitting next to me does, but we all do in that kind of way. So be a safe place. I think it's important to have immediate homework. So. First thoughts for you to be percolating on is does your school have mental health resources and crisis intervention services listed publicly? I know off the top of my head because we've done the research that 33% of schools have no mention of suicide prevention or crisis intervention, obviously relating to both of the work that we're all doing together on this. So ask, ask your school what they're doing about suicide prevention, where it is publicly listed in their policies, and if you don't have anything, reach out, advocacy at thetrevorproject.org. We have a model school policy, specifically built so that teachers and school staff can get the support and resources they need, not be told to do yet another thing. We deserve to make sure that resources are equitable. Our teachers are the front lines, our school staff are the front lines of great work, and we need to make sure that they um, are given those types of resources. Then we do have, um, make sure that these resources actually serve LGBTQ young people, people of color, and other high-risk populations. Where you have me here for a reason as an expert, look into the policies that you, these schools and other places may have and make sure that they recognize high-risk populations. Why? Because not rec recognizing high-risk populations like LGBTQ young people could cause us to slip through the cracks. So you'll also be able to find our model school policy there listed. Let's say you're an advocate, or you want to be one, or you're like, Sam, I think I could totally do some of this work. Text the word Trevor to the number 40649. Yes, I'm giving you immediate phone homework 
I can't see you because only you can see me right now. So I will not mind if you pull out your cell phone and text the word Trevor to the number 40649. I will never ask you for money. Literally have not, will not, cannot. And instead, I will use this as a way of like, hey, your state is currently debating a, a law about ending conversion therapy. Want to get involved? So please share this. Text the word Trevor to the number 40649 as a way to kind of engage on these types of LGBTQ youth mental health advocacy work. Boom! I made it. So these are all of the different resources that I've mentioned. I just have them all in one place for you, so that way you will have, be able to click on the link when you get the PDF. But um, I don't need to cover this anymore because I've already covered all those resources. That's my name. That's my email address. Yes, that's right. Okay, I was making sure I didn't misspell it. Right, sam.brinson at thetrevorproject.org. I am so grateful. So, so grateful for the opportunity to be here with all of you. And I think I'm going to open it up. Ken, we're going to have some time for questions. And I am going to go to the next slide. Yes, Q&A. Ken, my man, all up to you. I don't know if I can hear you, Ken. Hi, I lost my audio briefly. I'm sorry. No worries. Can you, can you hear me now, Sam? I just I want to you. say that was a, a beautiful and vulnerable um, presentation. And I wanted you to know that the chat function is showing a tremendous amount of love for you. Oh. And uh, I am very grateful for you uh, sharing that experience. I want to say as a psychiatrist, conversion therapy is grossly unethical, has no clinical basis, and under no circumstances should anyone be um, given aversive treatment to change a behavior. The idea you're supposed to be working with people to support them in their goals, not arranging goals for them. But I do want to uh, just uh, let you know that you had a big impact uh, in your talk, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. First question. Uh, let's talk about faith. You mentioned uh, faith. There's yeah. a question that relates to faith being traumatic. <laughs> Yeah. for LGBTQ youth. And I wanted to pursue that a little bit with you. How do you think about faith? How does faith work in a good way? What would you do to change things? So I'll start with the numbers and then I'll move to the personal. Um, the Trevor Project recently put out a whole research brief specifically on the idea. Um, everyone thinks that LGBTQ youth and faith communities are this kind of like divided world that near the two shall meet. And we actually found that a quarter of the LGBTQ youth that we serve say that faith is either very important or somewhat important to them. So a quarter of the people we're serving say that faith, faith matters, right? Like they don't want to just walk away from their faith. That, that's important to me because I myself am a person of faith. Um, I am in church, not that that makes me a person of faith, to be clear, um, but I, like, I go to my community building exercises of um, church. I, you know, I live my life in ways that I want people to see my faith practiced in, in good for the better, right? And yet, it's not a protective factor for most of us. Whereas faith is usually a protect, you're a psychiatrist, like, as a, as faith is usually used as a protective factor for a lot of communities of like a way to make sure that a high risk is potentially mitigated in part. But it doesn't work that way for LGBTQ youth because so many of them hear from their parents, families, and friends that their faith is antithetical to their sexual orientation or gender identity, which is not true, but they hear these statements and then they think that there's no place for them. So your question is important because it can be traumatic. It is traumatic because of a lack of understanding of acceptance. Um, I, as a person of faith, want to be very clear. Like, I'm not stating that we need to give up on our tenets of faith. I, that's, that is also antithetical to my work. Um, but I do believe that we could reevaluate our, our faith statements and how we talk about communities um, which may be in the room that we don't think about, right? This is the interesting part. It's not just about LGBTQ um, identity. There's a lot of things that we may say from the pulpit that we don't realize are having an impact in the pew because we're not thinking of that kind of diversity of you know, the body of Christ, right? And I know that's a little bit like religious, but that's actually something that I think we need to all take into effect is that LGBTQ people cannot just instantaneously say faith is bad. That is not helpful. LGBTQ youth are telling us that it's important to them, so we cannot say that. 
And people of faith cannot say LGBTQ people are only sinful and have no place in our, in our community. That's also not helpful because you may be, again, leading to suicidal ideation of the very people you're trying to interact with, right? So we need to recognize that these worlds are not as divided as they may seem. The press and others want to make this a debate that makes sense, right? Make something um, have two sides so that way you can always keep reporting on when they clash. Wouldn't it be great if we actually talked about the protective factors of faith that could come out of us actually interacting with each other in ways that are supportive of both identities, of both spaces, not stating that the people of faith need to leave their faith, nor that the LGBTQ people need to change who they are. Thank you, Sam. Uh, Sam, a question that's quite hopeful, but also speaks a little bit to the complexity for many people. Can sure. you discuss how parents can support their trans children? I think... <laughs> Um, so many it's a great questions. question, That's isn't it? A, um, very open question that I think probably honestly yes. could be its own um, presentation. I'll go into two spaces. First off is um, understanding that a child is learning about themselves. We, um, as parents, no, I'm not a parent, sorry. Parents uh, have an image. And we all are going of what their child will grow up to be. And we're all going through the idea of like, well, this is not this image, right? And sexual orientation is hard. It's why coming out to parents is difficult. I'm not giving my parents forgiveness for how they, what, what they did to me, right, in that way. They should never put me through conversion therapy. I have forgiven them, but like, that was not appropriate. However, I do recognize that their, their worlds were crashing. They thought, their child was going to grow up a certain way, and then their faith told them that that wasn't allowed, and then they had to try to respond to it. So in the same sense, for a trans child and a parent, a parent needs to recognize this is a learning moment on both ends. The trans child could also give grace. Let's be very clear. I'll call out my own community. We can give grace to parents who are trying, but um, be open to... Be open to moments of learning. Ken, I'm going to actually use you as an example. You are not my parent, but I'm going to use you as an example here, right? Like, um, when you introduced me the, in the last sentence, you accidentally used the word he, right? And it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. I moved forward, right? But well, I'm sorry about that. Where I say, like, actually, Ken, next time when you uh, refer to me, please just remember to use the word they and them because that's my pronoun. The same thing yes. for a parent, right? A parent needs to be open to, oh, yeah, yes, learning moment, right? Like, let's take that in, let's mm -hmm. understand that, and then let's move on into supporting my child as they are. Using the proper pronouns will not hurt you. Ha helping a child live a longer, happier, more productive life will mm. not hurt you. And giving yourself the grace to make mistakes and the um, courage to learn is exactly how I think we actually need to do it. We need to call, be open to call, call, we call it call in culture instead of call out culture, right? Like mm -hmm. call us into the conversation, right? Like yes. as a parent, be open to that and then say, and I'm going to do better by, um, you know, when I hear someone else referring to my child with the wrong pronoun, staying like in not, not aggressive, not arguing, yes. but just reminding, hey, this is what my child I, I know you love yes. my child X, you know, just as much as I do. They actually use the word they and them as their pronouns. Mm -hmm. Just helping you out, right? It doesn't need to be a big deal, but it yes. can make literally a life-saving difference. I hope yes, that's thank you. And I do apologize, Sam, yeah. um, for that. But I thank you because life is a continuous learning experience. Yes. And uh, the way you talk to me helped me to remember it going forward. I love the it. flip side of that, there's a few questions that are more painful around parents. Yeah. How do I tell my parents? How do I deal with the isolation I have felt around my patients? How do we build resilience around my parents? So these are all people that are on the less uh, hopeful side than how can I support my trans child, right? These yep. are people who are saying yep. that isn't my experience. And how do you think about that, Sam? <laughs> oh, um, in a couple of different ways. So 
Trevor Project has a whole guide on supported on how to be supportive. Right? So if you think that the conversation may not be great coming from you, but could be better if they could read it in their own time, feel free to use that kind of resource. We also have a, a coming out guide. So this is the idea of we don't actually tell LGBTQ youth, oh, the like pinnacle of your gay life will be when you come out and that's when mm. you can actually start, you know, living gaily, <laughs> right? We don't think that that's actually a good idea because that's not always safe for everyone, right? It's not always helpful. Parents don't always react well. And we need to recognize that and, and create safe places for the idea that it may not always be safe. Right? We literally have to address that. We just need to understand that that is an existence. And I think as a scientist, I always, right, I'm a nuclear engineer. I have literally planned for some really big disasters right, in my life. Um, and I have to recognize that I hope that those disasters never happen, but they could. And let's be honest. What my parents did to me was wrong. What many parents do to their LGBTQ youth is wrong. And there is never a responsibility on the person who is coming out or who is expressing these um, you know, moments of gender identity and uh, sexual orientation to their families or friends. There's never a responsibility to, to share that with anyone you don't feel like you don't want to, that you should have to explain or educate more than you um, want to, or have to, um, you know, forgive negative experiences. I want to be clear, I think forgiveness is really helpful. This is the annoying Pollyanna Sam, so just ignore it to the people who are asking the questions. Like, this is maybe not the right part, but like, I write a postcard to my family every two weeks. I have never gotten a postcard back. It doesn't mm. matter, because it's not about them. Mm. I am not writing those postcards to actually, like, guilt my parents into wanting a relationship with me. What I'm doing is creating a space where I say, hey, family, this is what's happening in my life. If you ever mm -hmm. want to come back into it, I want you to know that it's going really well and I'm really happy with it, right? Like, mm. I'm, I think it's important, even if you never said that postcard, right, to these people who are asking, like, what to do with, with painful parents, there is something powerful of putting that in a space of, hey, I'm here experiencing my life, I want you to know that when you want to rejoin it, that's awesome, but your, um, your inability to understand where I'm coming from is not my responsibility. That is not my responsibility, and I think that's a big part. Now, I'm saying that as a person of privilege, right, like where I can actually like not be with my family. If a person is with their family and this is experience that's happening, one, know your crisis numbers. That's why, that's why Trevor Project exists, right? Like, we are there to chat and to say, um, we want you to uh, be safe. And like whatever that takes to keep you safe, that's what's going to be most important. It's not about your parents. It's about you, right? So centering it on you. Um, yeah, that's actually where I'm going to end it, Ken. All of, this, mm. all of those questions rely around the point of selfishness that is the best kind of selfishness there is. Mm. Rely on internal um, strength and the crisis services and others that might exist. But like know that it's not your parents power it's your mm. own it's all your own mm. hopefully that helps yeah that's pretty good for a nuclear engineer because clinicians would say the exact same <laughs> thing focus on your own experience your own truth build a community that understands yep. and loves you right yep and create your life design your life that will work for you and um it's not about the other party which is a hard very hard thing to say if you're living with people who don't accept you. Yep. Um, I'm going to give you one second off, Sam, and ask a question for NAMI's leader in diversity, okay. Monica Villalta. Uh, Monica, a question, what's NAMI doing to make our uh, environment, our workplace, and our affiliates more open and inclusive? Well, thank you, Ken. Thanks for the opportunity. Sam, I'm just so delighted to have you with us today. And I want to say that NAMI has made an intentional effort to embed diversity, equity, and inclusion into our work. And I think having these conversations are so powerful because it makes us actually much better at the work we do, at the much needed work we do. And so I think that's part of the response, Ken. It's being able to be here, educating ourselves, and then taking action, as Sam so beautifully mentioned. I won't go further on our diversity and inclusion strategy, but I do want to say that I look forward to more opportunities like this in every single context 
when we as an organization are stronger because of our knowledge, and then as we little by little embed more of this messaging into every single product and service we deliver in our community. And I love, Sam, when you said, when you talk about the oppression of your people, and I just want to remind us all that for as long as a group of people are oppressed, we are all oppressed in one way or another. So I'm delighted you're here. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Monica. All right, Sam, your, your break is over. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, let's talk a little bit about um, how can we make LGBTQ youth, how can we help them without outing them? For example, a school teacher could create a, quote, safe space atmosphere in their classroom. But sharing preferred pronouns in the classroom could potentially leak outside and may cause them harm or the potential for bullying. What do you think about that, Sam? Oh, wow. We're doing the good questions here. Okay. Well, you know, it's after 5 um, o'clock, so you get the uh, A questions now. I like it. I like You've it. also demonstrated an ability um, to, to take just about any question under the sun, so I thought I would share some of the more challenging no, it's, ones. It's a really important question, and I think Monica actually gave us the perfect lead into it, which is the oppression of any is the oppression of all, right? So, so being clear that... Um, you, that resources are available to everyone are important, but also being clear that no one is required, for example, to um, to share more information than they ever want to share. Right? That's also super uh, important. It's why um, it, when I when I talked about it, right? I I said um, my pronouns, but I didn't necessarily require it of anyone else. If, yes, you're correct. You could out someone potentially, and. There has to be a recognition that you should be creating a space where that child feels comfortable sharing this information, but also knows that you will have their back when that information potentially doesn't go um, well over with their colleagues or their peers, right? So I am not saying you should ever require it, obviously, definitely not. But, but if, you have, if this child is feeling comfortable enough in your presence to potentially out themselves, right? They would never do it without actually trusting you because they, no one's going to just out themselves as a person living with lived experience, right? Like no one just outs themselves unless we think that we could potentially, like we're not doing it on a whim. It's not because it's Tuesday. Oh, we have to be out today, right? Like we're doing this because we trust you. And this, that your responsibility as a, pers as a professional is, okay, thank you for trusting me with this really important information. You're not making a big deal about it. Remember, you're not making a big deal about it. But you remember that information, you use that information, and, if, and you also create a space where they know that if that information is ever being used against them or to hurt them, you are the place that will defend that. You are, you are kind of creating a castle, um, right? You're creating mm. this, this, mm. this safe place that is more than just a sticker. The sticker is the first step, but the actual defense that's the whole point of safety, right? Like the whole the point of safety isn't just like, well, I've made it like up. You, if you have a question, you can ask me a question. Like, no, I'm I'm your defender. Allies educate other allies, and allies also say, you know, there's going to be times that I will need to step in here and make this an even safer space. Okay, that's one. The other part that I think is a uh, really good as a as an answer and response to that is. We need to remember that um, <laughs> what can we do? We can make sure, when, to go back to that oppression for all, that the bare minimum is being met. That's why I had that as the major homework action, is what is your school doing around suicide prevention, right? Because we all live in a school district, literally all of us. We may not have students in that school district, but we all live in a school district. And again, if a third of those school districts have zero mention of suicide prevention, and most of those schools have only a mention of suicide prevention in relationship, in relation, excuse me, to a um, uh, violence, aka a, a school shooting, right? Like, that's not a suicide prevention policy. And what can you do to protect, to support your, your LGBTQ youth? You know that they're at higher risk, so create a net for the highest risk. That's, that's the, I think I'm going to haul, haul end that question. Um, Ken, is that like you need to make sure that the, res the re resources are available and are tailored to the people who you're trying to help. So that way, even if they never use them, 
knowing the net is there lets you be a better, you know, tightrope walker. Mm. We are we are tightrope walkers as LGBTQ people. When we give you that information of our oh wow, this analogy is actually coming out together really well. So when we give you that analogy, when we give you the information of um our pronouns, right? And you're and you're saying like, oh, that could be an outing moment. Yeah, we're literally walking another step forward on that tightrope. Literally doing that with you. Um, and you need to respect that we're doing that. Give us the net behind it to protect us if we ever fall. And also make sure that nothing comes flying at us um, uh, while we're, you know, walking miles above the earth. That's a, that's a really, I have never used that analogy, but I think I'm actually mm. going to start using that from now on. It's um, right? brilliant. It's, it's the tightrope walk. The pronouns are that step out of faith. Mm. You have to be the net. You have mm. to create a net. And that net is there for everyone. Whether that tightrope walk walks or not, that net needs to be there um, as a safety space. There we go. Wow, Sam, incredible answer. Um, I'm now going to give you a softball. What is cool. your favorite opera or role you have played? Oh, um, I am totally a comedic bass, a baritone. <laughs> does not sound like my voice at all. I know. Um, so it's actually a well-known uh, name, Figaro. So I actually love to play Figaro. Um, mm. Le Notte de Figaro, which is the marriage of Figaro. Yep. Nice. One of my favorite. Okay. Oh, love it. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Thank you. Um, question. My child recently came out as trans feminine. She does not want to change her appearance or name until after high school. Yep. She would like us to refer to her as she, her, which we've been doing in our home outside with friends and with family. How can I protect her? Wow. Um, well, you're asking the first question, of, which is correct, which is protect, right? Protection is this idea of um, what can I do to make this person's experience easier? Knowing that it will be automatically harder, what do I do to make it easier? Um, it's how we should approach racism. It's how we should approach transphobia. It's how we should approach a lot of these issues. What can I do to make this person's experience who I know will be harder? How do I make that load a little bit lighter? Um, you're doing the right thing. If they ask you to use the pronouns at home um, of she and her, that's awesome. Use those pronouns. Without question, use those pronouns. That's, that's, that's what you've been asked. Do that. I couldn't, Ken, I couldn't quite hear you um, when you said that outside of the home they were using those pronouns or not, but Yes. Yes. Can be dependent. Yes. In are. our home and outside the home with friends and family. With friends and family. Great. This parent just wants to protect. Exactly. Thank you, Ken. Sorry, I appreciate that clarification. So the reason that I asked that was because I think there's important recognition that the friends and family is this like close knit circle that this person is trying to um, is basically t again. <laughs> I love this analogy. Right. They're taking steps out on that tightrope. Right. It's not just the family, family, right? It's families and friends, but they're giving you that permission, but not for everyone. They're not changing everything about themselves. They're not coming out maybe at school. To be very clear, statistically, that's very normal. I, I, know, I hate the word normal, but it's a, it's a normal, um, average kind of thing. Uh, most uh, trans youth are not out to a single adult at school. Most of them are not. So, mm -hmm. so it is very normal to not be sharing those experiences because of the fear of what could happen. Um, we know that bullying is very real and very present in our lives, and we need to make sure that um, that, that happens. So using, creating a safe castle for, to always come back to when you must understand, and I'm sure you already do, that they leave that castle every single day to go to a place where they can't get to be themselves, and that is so hard. They're choosing that. They're protecting themselves, and you need to give them even better armor. That armor is built up by you using the right pronouns, by you, if you use them incorrectly, catching yourself, saying, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. and moving forward, right? There is my expression, who my expression, right? Like, I, let, let's be very clear. Not every gender fluid individual you meet will look like me. We take all shapes, sizes, and expressions. Mm. My expression is only a snapshot of who I am as a person, right? Ken, you were seeing me, but you also saw me in a T-shirt a couple, you know, like a few days ago when we were prep, when we prepped for this, right? So you're seeing different moments of my mm -hmm. expression, and you That's would right. never say, "Oh, I know all about Sam," right? This one, you know, great outfit that they wore, right? No, we take people as holistic individuals, and parents, the best way to protect is to create holistic environments 
of that protection, not one-off. It is not just the, I remember to do it today, I get a gold, I remember to use the right pronouns today, I get a gold star. What are you doing actively to make sure that that person feels safe when they're at that home? And again, family and friends, you said that you were using the pronouns, correcting, being, being their, you know, king guard. Um, in this case, trans feminine, queen guard, right? Like, um, what do we do to say, hey, just want to remind you, this person um, to you wants to be very clear. This is not public for everybody, but like wants you to use these pronouns. That's a really important thing. I hope that kind of answered that question. I answered it beautifully, actually. A couple questions about what happened at the Supreme Court and how that relates to the Trump administration's um, rollback of protections. The question is, uh, the Supreme Court case deals with the workplace. Yeah. It does or doesn't reverse what happened on health care. Oh. I think I know the answer, but I wanted to make sure that you took this up because I think this is an important moment in jurisprudence. It is. It is indeed. So to be clear, by the letter of the law, the um, Affordable Care Act still stands. And that provides the protections for health care that trans individuals are getting. This was guidance mm -hmm. that was not law. Um, it's awful. It gives people power to do bad things, but it doesn't actually, it doesn't keep, it's not law. By other states, the Supreme Court on Tuesday said, you cannot discriminate based on gender identity or sexual orientation in employment. That, that, is, that is now from the highest court, defendable across um, the space. All of the different specific issues, healthcare, housing, all these other places have to all be litigated, but by defining sex as also implications of sexual orientation and gender identity in the law, everyone, I have yet to find a single person who disagrees with me on this, everyone is saying that that section 1557, which is what I was referring to with the, and this person is referring to with the like trans healthcare protections um, law, that section 1557, the Trump administration's trying to remove those protections will not stand because Title IX, which uh, I, this is so in the weeds, Title IX. No, but it's important for people to understand, you know, what's happening, uh, you know, so thank you for just breaking it down. Sure. Um, so Title IX is where the six and the, the, the protections are in that the transparent healthcare, and it refers to Title VII, which has now been, in, like, as we said, interpreted as inclusive. Mm -hmm. Friday. So everyone thinks this is a, that Friday is basically, last Friday was basically gone, but it doesn't mean that it actually is until the court case has actually happened, and multiple lawsuits are going to yes. happen. Multiple lawsuits yes. will happen, but the easiest answer and clearest concise space is it is never appropriate to to limit access to health care for transgender individuals because of their gender identity and if we wouldn't do it in employment there's no reason we should do it in health care right exactly but um prior to the supreme court case there were more than 25 states where that was not a protection isn't that right amen yeah. So uh, I wanted to ask a little bit while we're talking about legislative advocacy, uh, the next states that you feel that will ban conversion therapy and how people participating in today's chat can help. Well, people that's want great. to be part of this movement to undo this. Great, great question. So there are 30 states left to pass these laws. 19 of them have submitted legislation. Um, we're actually doing a lot of work on the city level. So what I will say right now is because state legislatures are kind of close for right now, but cities are open, you should look at your city and see if they have an ordinance in place. Most do not. Um, if you are in a state uh, that has already passed protections, sorry, my nose all of a sudden. Okay, if you are in a state that has passed protections, what you should be doing is communicating with your colleagues, your friends, your, your part, you know, those whom you interact with who aren't in that state, for the next state to do the work. It cannot be a, well, we're good. It has to be all of us. Um, as I say, the kid in California matters as much as the kid in Kansas. And that leads me to where those next states of work will be. Kansas and Kentucky are actually both moving forward on 
really great access to, um, again, we had cities that are passing laws against conversion therapy. Oklahoma, <laughs> Oklahoma just passed the first pro-LGBT vote in its entire state history mm. this year based on conversion therapy. It didn't make it all the way out, but a committee positive vote for LGBTQ youth in this way was radical, radically important. So how do people get involved? First, text Trevor to 40649. Second, I get put my email address up there. Email me if you are from a state or um, city where you would like to do this work and we have legislative language or city ordinance language, no city is too small. If you uh, are willing to save lives at LGBTQ youth, no city is too small. We have literally had cities of a few hundred pass these ordinances, but it tells us the youth in that city, you are safe. We are fighting for you. LGBTQ youth have no, no remote um, reason to be put into conversion therapy because of its harm, and we want to be part of it. So advocacy at the trevorproject.org, Trevor to 40649. And then last but not least, how do you get involved? You share the information you learned with those who you interact with. Use the word, use the hashtag 50 bill 50 states. That's the campaign that we do to work to end conversion therapy. I'll repeat that again. Hashtag 50 bill 50 states. Mm -hmm. um, use that hashtag, use hashtag conversion therapy on all of your social media. Like right now, there's a, like potentially a thousand of you watching if you all put something out on your social media today about hashtag conversion therapy, you will change the conversation, right? People will realize, oh my God, that's still happening. And you're going to be like, yeah, I actually heard from an individual um, who says that it's happening and, and that they're getting calls every single week about people that's, ha that's happening. So we need to act now to make sure that that doesn't happen in the future. That's, I guess, three big ways that I would say we can talk about it. Hopefully that helps, Ken. Sam, incredible. And this has been an incredible uh, discussion, and uh, I want to thank you again for your leadership. Uh, the NAMI research staff has revealed to me that you sing, uh, and your songs are available on YouTube. So I want to ask you, with your permission, could this Ask the Expert, which lives on the NAMI website, sure. uh, be linked to some of your favorite tunes? Uh, I understand you sing uh, The Impossible Dream. Oh, you should definitely use that. So that was when I was actually telling my story. So that was my Broadway. I was on Broadway um, mm -hmm. uh, doing a presentation, not a presentation, a, um, you know, a play where we were all sharing our stories. And I share my story of going through conversion therapy, write a letter mm -hmm. to my younger self, telling them how I'm so excited that they didn't, didn't die by suicide, right? Like that they kept fighting. And then I sing that song, which if you look at the lyrics, it's very uh, Coco. That would be perfect. I highly give you permission. Um, okay. That documentary is going to be coming out soon, but I would love for you to show my Broadway debut uh, mm -hmm. a song of the Impossible Dream. Absolutely. Sam, I just got chills when you told that story. I, I'm so moved by your work and your experience and your leadership, and I want to thank you. And I hope you'll come back to, to join us at NAMI with Ask the Expert. Anytime I'm invited, my friend, this has been an amazing experience. I'm so grateful. Um, and thank you to all the staff uh, who are involved in getting this ready. I know I wasn't the easiest person. There's so many things going on in our lives. <laughs> Welcome to doing You're this. And great. <laughs> but we made it happen, and, and I'm so grateful. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, I'm going to turn it over to our Chief Executive Officer, Dan Gillison, to close us out. Thank you, Ken and um, uh, Sam. Um, uh, they, them. I, I just can't thank you enough. You mentioned at the very beginning raising voices and and for all that you're doing in raising voices and it, it is all about leadership at the beginning and the end of the day. So we want to thank you for your leadership and what's so incredibly um, um, uh, engaging about your presentation is that you talked with us uh, and, and to be able to do that with technology is just absolutely incredible and your ability to talk uh, with us and to us has just been fantastic. And thank you for uh, what you've shared. And we can't think of anyone we would rather hear from uh, in Pride Month than you. And um, I, I have to tell you that it was absolutely sensational. And, and um, when you start talking about the impossible dream, we, 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 we hear you. We hear you. And that's a part of we hear you and we want to make sure that everyone that 
that uh, listened, saw, and heard you today, we want them to know they are not alone. So that's what you see up on this last slide. And we want people to know that. The other thing is, um, uh, as you heard earlier, I've already done it, and uh, I, I, I would recommend to everyone again, please text Trevor to 40649. Uh, the other thing is that there is a survey that you will all receive at the end of this uh, um, a broadcast and presentation, if you will, please uh, complete the survey. That survey allows us to um, um, hear from you on, on topics uh, to bring to you and to make sure that we're very crisp in, in the topics that we bring to you and the talent that we bring to you and the leaders we bring to you. Uh, last but not least, for those that want to uh, hear this um, and see this again, go to nami.org backslash ask the expert. Um, two other things in closing is to um, remind everyone that on next Thursday, a week from today, we will have uh, um, another Ask the Expert, and the subject will be Impact of Racism and Trauma on Black Mental Health. Um, and <clears throat> that is one that you'll definitely want to uh, participate in and tell your peers and colleagues. Uh, we also have the Youth Speak webinar that is next Tuesday. So last but not least with this is, um, as, 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 as Sam uh, led us now, I'll lead us at the very end with just thanking the staff because, you know, when you talk about a, a production like this, as, as, as uh, when the curtains open, you guys see the performance, but you don't see all that goes uh, on behind it. Um, and I wanted to thank Christine Allen, Elizabeth Stafford, Elise Hunt, Terry Brister, Dr. Ken Duckworth, and Monica Vallalta for all of their work in, in, in bringing these uh, uh, topics to, to you all. And in closing, uh, thank you all very much. Hope you have a great close to your week and a wonderful weekend. And Sam, again, thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you.